Let me introduce you to safecubbies.com. Safecubbies.com offers modular office solutions designed to elevate your office space into a safe, workable, and functional environment. Their cubicles, dividers, and modular workplace systems can be customized with graphic branding, sneeze guards, whiteboards, acrylic sheets, and magnetic panels. Most importantly, most of the surfaces are made of non-porous materials which make for easy cleaning. Adding to the professional series, there are private room solutions as well as their classroom series. SafeCubbies.com is a local company with over 15 years experience working with the nation's leading modular display manufacturers. Give them a call at 754-216-1071 or visit them online at SafeCubbies.com. Once again, that number is 754-216-1071 for SafeCubbies.com. Com. Let me introduce you to another sponsor to the podcast. You break wheel repair and remanufacturing company. Tired of your wheels? Give your car a new and refreshed look by powder coating them a new color. Even make it heat, hurricanes, or dolphins colors. Wheels faded and scratched? Renew them with our in-house wheel refinishing. They'll also repair cracked and bent rims while also offering in-home service. They also offer powder coating and full metal finishing of many other metal items such as outdoor furniture. You Break Wheel Fix has 15 years experience based right here in North Miami. You can check out a gallery of their work on Instagram at you, that's the letter U, Break Wheel Fix. That is you, Break Wheel, W-H-E-E-L, Fix. For information, call 305-748-0112 or you can also visit them on the web at youbreakwheelfix.com. That number again is 305-748-0112. Welcome to Three Yards Per Caddy, a podcast covering the Miami Dolphins and the NFL. Now, here's your hosts, Chris, Alf and Simon. And we're on, and welcome to another edition of Three Yards for Carry. This is your training camp preview edition. I have Simon Clancy here. Chris Kaufman is not here. He is on vacation. Now, let me introduce you to an, the official beer sponsor of Five Reason Sports and Three Yards for Carry, and that's Biscayne Bay Brewing Company. Of course, I love their Miami Pale Ale. Their Saison is my favorite. Their, what is it? How, how do I say it? Lager? Lager. I mean, don't lager. complicate it. Okay, no, just, just lager. Lager, okay. Like, do you remember Jeff Jeff Lagerman who used to play for the for the Jets? Perfect. Yeah, their Marlins lager. lager is very 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 good. I've had it. I did buy their Tropical Bay IPA. I haven't tried it yet. I will have a review next week. You want more information? Go to BiscayneBayBrewing.com, or of course, just go to Publix or ABC Liquors or Total Wine. You can pick it up there, or have it delivered to you via Instacart. All right, Simon. You saw you saw two a throw today. It was exciting, huh? I mean, man throws ball. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. Even Tied more exciting. Yes. Much. He's going to have his own show September sixth on Fox, Simon. Yeah, I, I find this very interesting actually because uh, there's part of me that thinks you know, and I'm obviously going to watch it as I'm sure most of the listeners will. But there's a the, there's also part of me that thinks just concentrate on doing your job. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I don't see um, I don't see uh, Justin Herbert or Joe Burrow doing eight part documentaries on Fox. Uh, and I get that he's a heralded player, but just just come in, work hard. I mean, I'm sure he is working hard, but just just do your job. There should only be one focus right now, especially this off season more than any other. Mm. And that should be learning how to play quarterback and not necessarily making eight part documentaries. I, I, I'm not sure how well that sits amongst players in the locker room. Um, you know, I, I look at, I love the kid and I think he's going to be extra special, but you know, the job is the job. You know, I don't think Aaron Rodgers, I don't think Fran Tarkenton, I don't think, you know, Tom Brady, they, I don't think they were making documentaries in their first year. Let's just, you know, get on the field, prove you can play, prove you belong. Then you can start making docs. That to me just sits a little bit uncomfortably. You know, I'm not trying to be a party pooper or, you know, mm. a fun sponge, but you know, let's, um, Let's get on the field and uh, and do some things, and then you know, then you can do that that sort of thing. Especially since there's not going to be any preseason, so you know, even though you know, me and Chris, you know, we're two of truthers, so you know, we think he's starting week one, but it's kind of, we're kind of saying it tongue in cheek, 
but I was convinced, to be honest with you, that he was going to win the job if we had a full preseason because I thought it was going to be overwhelming. But since we're not going to have a preseason, I find it damn near impossible for him to win the job in, what, 14 padded practices? Yeah, that's not... It's almost, it's almost like you, you, you've been listening to what I've been saying. Yeah, no, no, of <laughs> course. <laughs> but you know, had there been some preseason, I would have taken anybody's bet. I'm, I was pretty certain he was going to win the job outright. Now it's going to be, you know, it's a tall order. It's to say the least. Now, speaking of tall order, let's talk about the defense to start off this preview. They're going to want to play a lot of quarters. At least, you know, that's what they tried to do toward the end of last year. And uh, Coach Flores says something very interesting in one of his uh, availabilities. And he says that it's uh, more importantly back there as far as the safeties is communication. And he wants somebody to basically take charge as far as calling the numbers. And when I say calling the numbers is – when you play quarters, you got to call either ones or twos. Ones are on the outside, twos are on the inside, and you got to call the switches on man coverage, okay? Namely, that's something that Rashad Jones was pretty bad at. Bobby McCain supposedly was really good at it. At least that's what Brian Flores says. So it, I guess it's a two-part question. Who are the, the guys that are going to be they're gonna be playing that role? And the second part, to that question is, is our safety group as bad as it looks? I mean, he got rid of the guy that should be doing it. Let's make that clear. You know, whatever we think of Minka Fitzpatrick and the way yes. he got out of it, mm -hmm. ultimately, that's the position he, he should be playing. And it was clear with what he did in Pittsburgh last year that there's going to be a, a very uncomfortable reckoning in years to come mm -hmm. uh, and i strongly suspect that minka will fit along the path of jake long over matt ryan ronnie brown over aaron Rodgers, you know jamar fletcher over drew Brees, um those sorts of questions you know ted ginn over let's, you know, let's be clear it's only been two seasons but the man is on a hall of fame trajectory already i mean the way he played last year he was yes. close to winning an nfl defensive mvp and i you thought know, he, he was really first... really good as a rookie he was brilliant yeah, as a rookie for Miami, rookie well. uh, and what did he finish? He finished like in the top five in Rookie of the Year voting too. Yeah, so, um, defensive. You know, rookie. so uh, they clearly do like McCain, but at some point the rubber has to meet the road in terms of what you do. You know, I think we all think that Bobby is a serviceable player, um, potentially best suited nickel rather than than safety. Um, and the big question is whether or not you know Brandon Jones, who's a kid they obviously really like whether or not he can fill that position long-term. Because, you know, I don't think McCain necessarily is long for this team in terms of you look at the mm. contract versus what he does, what he delivers. But the thing that he does do very well is organise on the back end. There's, there's question marks about the safety group. You know, Eric Rowe played really well last year, but it's the first time he's ever stayed healthy. You know, Stephen Parker is an interesting guy who played pretty well when he was thrown into the mix. McCain has his physical limitations, but not the mental ones. There's a lot of weight on the shoulders of Brandon Jones. Will they play Byron Jones sometimes at safety? I strongly mm -hmm. suspect they will. And then, you know, Colbert, Fajedalum, Kayvon Frazier, they're guys. I don't suspect that they're going to be pushing to start, but somebody's going to have to step up. And I think in an ideal world, they'd like it to be Brandon Jones. But whether or not that happens, especially in such a truncated offseason, I think it's very unlikely. What I think you probably will see is a lot of McCain, a lot of Parker, a lot of uh, Eric Rowe, and probably Fajedalum being mixed into the mix, and they'll bring along uh, Brandon Jones slowly. But, um, you know, you do think that he is the future, but he's got a lot to live up to. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you saw, did you see uh, Hard Knocks last night? The, the first well, I didn't episode? know. It doesn't, it doesn't come out over here until I think it's 48 hours after, or maybe it's tonight, but I haven't seen it yet. Okay. Uh, Anthony Lynn, uh, by the way, both coaches came off extremely likable. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Sean McVay and Anthony Lynn. And Anthony Lynn said something that was very interesting. Uh, they got rid of a player, spoiler alert. And Anthony Lynn told that guy that there's going to be a lot of transactions because teams are going to try to get deeper and not necessarily at positions of strength, but they're going to, I would say, mine the, the waiver wire consistently. Does this safety group need work? 
is that something that they, the Dolphins could be doing? I mean, I think it, I think it's pretty much every position the Dolphins have needs work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think safety is any, uh, is any uh, different to that. What I would say about the waiver wire guys is that they've kind of got those guys already. Colbert, Frazier, Parker, Fajedlam. They're, they're kind of in mean, their sort of bottom of the roster special teams guys who can mm-hmm. play in a pinch. I don't think they need those guys. What they do need is a banner guy who can play the position. Um, you know, and they've certainly got those two guys on the on the outside if they're healthy, uh, in in Jones and in Howard. But um, it's clear that Brandon Jones, you know, you don't draft that kid where you drafted him, you know, which is what the seventieth pick overall over a number of other good players. Um, if you don't think he is going to be a guy who could sit and play deep safety for you mm-hmm. uh, and be a big communicator on the back end. You know, um, so I, I don't think they're going to be minding the waiver wire for guys that are all of a sudden going to come in and, you know, uh, and do a job. They're clearly going to continue to do that at corner. And we saw they signed Breon Borders today, who's a guy who's kicked around about seven or eight different teams. You know, the Raiders, the Bills, the Texans, the Jags, Washington, Pittsburgh, you know, um, seven tackles in his career. So, you know, he looks like just a guy. But I think they're certainly going to do some peddling on the with the guys at corner. I just don't think that the the, the depth is what they need to look at. It's the it's the actual contributors potentially, especially if Eric Rowe gets hurt. Yeah, they need to they need to have some versatility, especially hopefully. And you know, I know this is hoping a lot because this is a this is a rookie after all. But Noah Igbenogany, did I get it right? Mm, you did. Okay. If he pans out and pans out big, and I know this is asking a lot, but it's happened before. It's not crazy to, to think that a rookie can step in and contribute. Then that gives him a little bit of versatility to use Byron Jones in different spots. And of course, if we get the Nick Needham of that little stretch from last year, mm. then that helps as well. I think the, I think the thing about Igbenogane is that you don't need him to come in and be a massive contributor early on because last year they found a guy in Nick Needham who was awful in preseason, not particularly good at the start of the season and just revolutionized himself to, to the point where, mm-hmm. you know, he played really well down the back end, but you've also, you know, we saw Jamal Wiltz or Perry knee Wiltz. Um, we saw Ken Webster play, you know, pretty well. Um, Tay Hayes performed pretty well um, down the stretch. So there's guys there that you don't necessarily, uh, you know, hoping that, that Howard is is healthy, both from the knee and from the coronavirus, and that he's now on the COVID nineteen list. Um, so you don't necessarily need Noah to come in and and really be a performer early on, but you'd love to see it certainly, especially if if Howard goes down, because you kind of feel like you know Needham could be that fourth corner um, if those three guys, Howard Jones and Igben can can really kick off and and get on the field early. Yeah. All right. Now let's move on to the linebackers. Uh, last year, Jerome Baker called most of the signals for the front seven. Uh, this year, it seems he's starting to do that once again. Now, is that going to hold up? Is that eventually something that Cal Vinoy might take over? But basically, I'm asking you, what, what are your expectations for Jerome Baker? Because it seems like they're putting the same load on him, at least to start these, these walkthroughs. They're putting the yeah, same load it- on his shoulders once again. Yeah, I don't think you, why would you take it away? I thought he played pretty well. You know, the, the one thing that always concerns me about Baker is whether or not he can hold up physically because he is slightly undersized. Yes. Um, but but I think he'll benefit from from Van Noy's experience as much as anything. And, uh, you know, I, I think Raekwon McMillan played really well at times, you know, especially against the run. You need that kind of guy. But, you know, the way that they use Baker... It's such a sort of hybrid role, really. He's, you know, he blitzed a lot. Will will we see those blitz packages of Baker pressuring up the middle in those sort of old Tiger formations that Jason Taylor used to run? You know, what's the role for guys like Van Ginkle? What's the the role for guys like Gruja Hill? What's the role for guys like Vince Beagle? Do you know what I mean? In terms of mm. pressure, because the Dolphins had to create pressure in different ways last season. You know, we saw Needham blitz quite a lot towards the back end of the season. Obviously, Baker blitzing a lot and uh, with the knowledge that we just weren't going to get to the quarterback because we didn't have the horses up front to be able to do that. Um, now, you know, do we feel now that, you know, we've signed Lawson and we've signed, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Ogba, does that mean that, 
you know, now we're going to lessen those blitzes from Jerome Baker? Is he going to be moved in a different direction in terms of what we ask him to do? Uh, but I think having Van Noy there and his experience is going to be huge, you know, for, for the Dolphins, but also huge for, for Baker. But I don't see why you would change anything. You know, Van Noy didn't make the calls with the Patriots, Donta Hightower did. So, you know, I think you probably just want to keep things the same because uh, as much as schematically it's very, very close to what Van Noy did in, in New England, Baker knows the system inside out. Yeah. Now, last year, uh, most of us thought that Van Ginkle could make a contribution, but a lot of people didn't really see Vince Beagle coming out of anywhere, uh, coming out of nowhere. This group seems kind of, you know, I would say crowded. Uh, Robert Ford's hmm. already said that Alana Roberts is not going to be training too much at fullback and is playing linebacker. Hmm. Where is the surprise this year in the linebacking group? Or is it just going to be, they're just going to subtract from that group from last year? I, I think there's no stars there. I think Van Noy is obviously a very good player. I think if they can keep Van Ginkle and Beagle healthy, because they're pretty much the same guy, um, you know, and you wonder whether or not, you know, does a Curtis Weaver threaten one of those two guys in terms of, Van, you know, a Van Ginkle and Beagle playing for one spot? You know, I, I think Eguavan is probably on the outs. Uh, I think Gruja Hill is a guy that, they, that they're that they going to like, both in sub-packages, but also special teams. He's a really good special teams player. McMillan seems like he's obviously going to gonna be there. And then, you know, do, I mean, how many guys are they going to keep? Six? We don't see teams can keep more than six linebackers. What do you think Baker's going to make the squad? I mean, let's, let's look at the guys that pretty much could make the squad. Um, you know, Baker, I mean, he's an absolute lock to... To, to make the team, Baker, Beagle. Let's go through alphabetically. Baker, Beagle, Gruja Hill, McMillan, Roberts, Van Ginkle, Van Noy. That's seven straight away, and we haven't even talked about Curtis Weaver, mm-hmm. Egwavan, who made the team. You know, so there's what's that? Nine players. Yeah, Van Ginkle, Camu uh, Gruja Hill. I'm pretty certain that that Gruja Hill will make the team. Because he's yeah, one of the best special too. teamers in football. In so. the league, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, you need those guys. But, yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, whether or not they redesignate Curtis Weaver as a, as a defensive end, for example, you know, a mm-hmm. sub-package pass rusher, you know, you're going to need him, especially with the injury history of, uh, uh, of a guy like Ogba. Um, you know, but I, I, I do think, you know, James Crawford, Egwavan, Kyler Johnson, Munson, I think those guys, Tyshawn Render, I think they're probably going to struggle to make the team. Um, but I do suspect that potentially Van Ginkle and, and Beagle are playing for one spot, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out vis-a-vis Curtis Weaver, you know, because if you can get to the quarterback like he did at Boise State, you will, you know, he almost has to make the team. All right, let's move on to the defensive line. This is a unit that I really do like. There's a lot of players on that, mm. side, on, on that line that I really, really like. I think Shaq Lawson is a, you know, he's an above average NFL player, but I think Raekwon Davis can be a steady performer in this league for a very long time. And Manny Ogba, in my opinion, can put up a big sack number this coming year. But there's one guy who was drafted pretty high and nobody really knows what he's going to be, but expectations should be pretty high. Kristen Wilkins, what are your expectations for him this season? Yeah, I thought he played all right last year. I just think he's got to be, you know, you're looking for a guy who's going to step out of the pack. You know, and, and if you just said, two, if we were doing this podcast two years ago and you, you were saying that Raekwon Davis is a Miami Dolphin, you'd be like, okay, this is a guy you build the defensive line around. Right. And, and I think that's got to be a position that, you know, where is the Raekwon Davis of two years ago? Where yeah, right now, Davis? right now, I, I would say that what we're hoping for is that we get Randy Stark for eight years here. He has the potential to be as good as he wants to be. Yes. You know, he was scratched. What the I like about him is he has a very high floor. Would you agree mm, with that? hundred percent. He has, he scratched the surface of his physical liberty or his physical gifts at Alabama, you know, heavy handed movement skills. The ability certainly showed the ability to get off the quarterback. We talked about him as a top 10, potential top 10 pick mm-hmm. 18 months, two years ago. Where is that guy? If they can find that guy, and if he can find it himself, he could be anything he wants to be. Uh, and that allows Wilkins to to continue to grow. I mean, Christian Wilkins needs a big season. You know, we need to see the Christian Wilkins that we saw at Clemson. Um, you know, and that needs to, to step to the fore. He needs to be more of that guy. Um, 
and I think he can be. I really like him. I think he's a really good player. I don't think he played particularly well. Uh, it consists, I don't think he played consistently well um, as a rookie, but obviously, you know, there are struggles that, that, that rookies go through. But I think it's an interesting group, but I think you need somebody to step up. Is that Wilkins? It's a contract year for Davin Godshaw. Is it him? But could it be Raekwon Davis? But, you know, you look at, can you get Ogba and Lawson off the edge? What what role will Zach Sealer play? You know, a guy all three of us really like who, mm. you know, doesn't, what he does doesn't show up on the stat sheet necessarily. But what he actually does physically in terms of his abilities to get to the quarterback, in terms of his abilities to use his hands to stack and shed, to stuff the running, to, the running game, that's really, really important. So, you know, there are some interesting guys there, but there's got to be, you've got to see emergence now. We can't just, it can't be patter cake anymore. There's got to be players who are really making a, you know, who are really collapsing pockets, who are getting to quarterbacks, because that's the one thing the Dolphins, you know, couldn't do. And you hope that if Howard, Noah, uh, and Byron can can shut people down on the outside. That's going to make the job easier for the guys up front. But, you know, they've got to help out too. They've got to get to the quarterback. Now to finish up here on defensive side of the ball, back to Christian Wilkins. Last year, I said that the highest, like the, the most optimistic I could be on Christian Wilkins is that he ends up becoming Fletcher Cox. Now last year, I didn't see any glimmer of that happening. Is that over with? Or is there still star potential there? Oh, I, I, I don't think you can. Um, I don't think you can. Um, you can't designate a guy as not to be something after one season. Do you know what I mean? He's mm-hmm. he's clearly um, he's clearly a good player. Um, but look, history is littered with players that didn't perform brilliantly as as rookies, and then who developed. You know, he's never going to be Aaron Donald. Like, you know, we know that, but then he was never drafted to be Aaron Donald. Um, but he's got to become the player. Like I said, he's got to become the player that we saw at, we saw at Clemson. He has got to begin to take over. Um, and he didn't do that last year. Um, and he's got to do that this year. And I, but I don't think it's as easy just to write him off and say, he can't be this after year one, especially on the te- the terrible team that we had, yeah. you know, he's not, he's probably not the sort of player who's going to be able to take over a game himself, but with a good supporting cast next to a performing Raekwon Davis, if Lawson is getting to the, you know, with Van Noy, all those sorts of things, then he can absolutely become a sort of pro bowl type player. But, you know, he needs to, um, he needs to go back to being Clemson. Clemson Christian. All right, Simon, tell our listeners about a certain male hygiene product that is a sponsor of the show. Yeah, it's Manscaped. And if you are, I mean, let's not be around the bush, literally. <laughs> I mean, you need, you need to get your hands on some Manscaped. So support for uh, three yards per carry is brought to you by Manscaped, who are the best men's below the waist grooming product pretty much that you can buy I'm apparently over here as well now so no excuses for you european listeners um the precision they just got their tools. first by the way not to interrupt you but they just got their first nfl oh. sponsorship they sponsor the 49ers they do sponsor the 49ers yes i mean what does that tell you about some of the 49ers players they need to shape up in the under trials department um uh, obsessive over their technology as people who've used them will tell you um, providing the best tools for the best grooming experience. I mean, look, nobody likes a, you know, a hairy set. I mean, maybe you do, maybe if you're listening and you know, you're a woman, you like it, but let's be realistic. Nobody really likes it. So, you know, get the manscaped. That's what you need. Redesign the electric trimmer engineering team spent essentially 18 months perfecting the greatest nut hair trimmer words I never thought I'd say on a podcast ever created. And they just released the new and improved lawnmower 3.0, which features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents because nobody likes an accident down there. Nobody likes to nick yourself down there because I can tell you from experience that it's painful. Um, the battery lasts up to 90 minutes, although God knows, I mean, you, you have serious issues if you are cutting down there for 90 minutes. I mean, give it give it a break, lads. Um, nobody needs to go at those bad boys for 90 minutes. Um, it has an LED light for when you're stuck in a mine shaft and need to uh, need to trim your balls. Um, and why wouldn't you? If you're stuck in a mine shaft, you've got to have something to keep yourself occupied. Um, but if you're listening to me speak right now about the Lawnmower 3.0, experience it for yourself. Trim that junk 
get 20% off plus free shipping with the code 5R. What is it? Our 5RS? Is that right? N. Five oh, reasons, yes. five RSN. Five, yes, there you go. Five RSN at manscaped.com. Your wife will thank you. Your girlfriend will thank you. Your boyfriend will thank you. But most of all, your nuts will thank you. Let me return you now to your previous programming. <laughs> all right. Okay. Now moving on to the offense. We're not going to start where you know where it's so obvious, but ESPN gave us a lot of love the other day, and they were calling. Howard and Breda, the best running back group in the AFC East. Now, that's a lot of praise considering who's in the AFC East. But they were mentioning yeah. them as, as, a, uh, as they were saying, say something that's off the wall but could be true. And I forgot the name of the analyst. I believe it was Marcus Spears. He said the Dolphins, Howard and Breda could be the best running back group in the AFC East. Does that have merit? Are the, is yeah, of course it a does. good running back group? Yeah, I think those two can be excellent. They've got to stay healthy. Both of them have had injury issues. Yeah, Brady's got to prove that he can come out of the Carl Shanahan system um, uh, and be effective. But he has electric speed. I mean, he's one of the fastest guys in the NFL. Huge question marks about the offensive line that we'll get to. You know, he's not running behind the guys that, you know, he's not running behind Joe Staley and Mike McGlinchey and those guys that he was in San Francisco. You know, he's running behind... Jesse Davis and Eric Flowers and, you know, probably a couple of rookies and, and Ted Larson. So, you know, it's not the same. It's definitely not the same group. Jordan Howard, for me, three years ago, was probably the best inside-outside zone runner in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Got to stay healthy. Under-the-radar kid. I mean, he was a really good under-the-radar running back with the Bears. I thought he was, you know, a really, really, really good player. Um, he just needs to stay healthy. But you watch the game, you know, you watch the game from Lambeau last year where the Eagles came from behind to beat the Packers and he took over that game. Yeah. Um, he was unfortunate that he got injured because his um, performances were more sporadic after the injury. But I think if the Dolphins can keep him healthy and mixing him and Breda in and probably Miles Gaskin as well and Patrick Laird, who they really like, you know, I think, I, I, you know, I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility it's the best running back group in, in the AFC. It's absolutely not. And, you know, whilst you might not see a pro ball back and a thousand yard guy, you probably end up seeing, you know, both the two league guys with seven, eight, nine hundred yards amongst them because the team's going to need them, especially with the, the issues that we um, will go on to discuss at wide receiver. Yeah. And interesting enough, if we're talking about the AFC East and running back groups, uh, there's something going on with Sonny Michelle, Sonny Michelle, because the Patriots mm. went out and signed Lamar Miller and he's working first team mm. right now. So I don't know if it's injury or there's an attitude issue, but you know, Sony Michelle all of a sudden has a lot of competition, but that's yeah, a pretty good group weird. right there. Yeah. I, I think um, I wouldn't be surprised if it was related to his knee. I've got to say there were issues with his knee, obviously at Georgia. Um, and he had a great rookie year. He, he was always seen as a really good kid. So I don't really understand why, um, why there necessarily would be an issue, but um, you know that's not a great look for um, for Sony Michel if he's struggling to to break into that first team uh, lineup because you know Lamar Miller's a decent player, but Sony Michel should be beating him out. All right, and to tidy up the running backs, uh, how did Callum Balage forget to catch the ball? Like, is that a skill oh. that you actually forget to use? I think probably because I mean I don't know if you have them over here, but um, Casio, they make watches. Uh, people with no hands who can't catch over here are called Casios because the Casio watches don't have any hands. They're just electronic. Um, so maybe we should start calling Kalen Balaj Casio Balaj because because uh, he's got no hands. I mean, what happened to this kid? I don't know. I don't know. His tape coming out of Arizona State was all about those hands, and uh, he had great hands. Clean. He would catch it. His transitions were fast, clean. He would get into get into stride, and last year he actually forgot how to catch the football. Like he ha- he had no clue whatsoever. Now Eric Studsville this week came out and said, "Nah, you know, you know, it, you know, last year's last year." And he this is a guy that wants to be good. I guess we could finish up the running back group by saying this: Is anything salvageable there with Kellen Blash? I mean, I think he's going to struggle to beat out Laird and Gaskin. I've always said that. You know, I I think. Um, you know, I think partly it's confidence for him, but those numbers were so bad last year. Yeah, uh, and, you know, that was you not an NFL player. That was just not an NFL player last year. 
you could say that the, the the offensive line was bad and it was, but it wasn't affecting Patrick Laird. No. So, you know, at some point you've just got to say, actually, you know, maybe you move in a different direction. And I think ultimately it'll come down to, to, to between him and Gaskin um, and who do they trust more. Um, but I'm just not sure that Balage is the guy. Mm-hmm. Well, moving on to the, to the wide receivers, uh, they had a defection. Um, well, he opted out. Albert Wilson. This is a guy that they were going to count on. I guess Albert Wilson's career as a Miami Dolphins is essentially over. Well, you would agree with that, right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I think it's a big loss, actually. I think, I think Albert so Wilson's too. a big loss. Um, you know, Alan Hearns, was he going to make the team? Maybe, maybe not. I, I think 50, Wilson's 50, a big I would say. Yeah, Wilson's a big loss. Um, you know, and that receiver group, all of a sudden, you know, you're playing an awful lot of merit on the shoulders of... Devonte Parker, given that really he's only had one very good year, a couple mm-hmm. of okay years. And you Preston Williams, asking, who already started today with the circus catches. So Yeah, of course. But, you know. You have two guys again, you really, really like, I guess. Oh, do you, though? I mean, you have one guy who has been inconsistent throughout his career. Mm-hmm. Um, but that had Parker, a great year last year. Though. But had a great year. You've got one guy who looks like he could be amazing one minute, drops the easiest pass the next minute, and is coming mm-hmm. off an ACL in Williams. Uh, and then realistically, let's be honest, you've got just a bunch of guys. I mean, yes. you know, Jakeem Grant NFL is fine. Players. NFL players. Can't, but, you know. can't stay healthy. Fits the scheme, but can't yeah. stay healthy. You know, Isaiah Ford, I think, will be a, a decent player for this team. Um, wouldn't surprise me if he, you know, ended up as a, probably the third best receiver on the team in terms of the third number of catches on the team. And then it's really, you know, Chester Rogers, meh, you know, Malcolm Perry, we all like Perry, but you know, he's got to get in games and play and that, you know, the off season, the truncation of the off season has really not helped him. Kirk Merritt, you know, he's fighting a losing battle potentially. Ricardo Luis was re-signed, but is he going to make the team? Same with Gary Jennings, you know, I don't know. Matt Cole, I like Matt Cole. Matt Cole could be, you know, Matt Cole was one of the best special teamers in all of college football across FBS and Matt Collins and had some moments as well. Yeah, you know, so I don't know. We'll have to see what happens. But I think uh, uh, an average, a C-plus group probably just slipped down to a, you know, a C minus or even a D with the with the Albert Wilkins uh, Albert Wilson defection. Look, and we wish these guys luck. You know, we we you know, I'm sure I speak for most people listening who say that you know they fully understand the reasons behind why these guys are not playing. Um, but it, it, it's a shame that Albert Wilson is um, is missing because I think he'll be a loss. And I actually wouldn't surprise me if the Dolphins looked. You know, there's some action around the waiver wire, and there's some you know. Mm. Some of those cuts that happen towards the the start of the season, the Dolphins, I think, will be mining that area uh, absolutely because I, I don't think this group is necessarily set. And by God, you can be pretty sure that they'll be looking at, at wide receivers pretty high in next year's draft. Yeah, I was asked yesterday on the Buffalo Bills podcast I did yesterday, uh, the Rock Pile Report, and I was asked who's our slot receiver, and I said it could just be that you know Mike Gusecki is the slot receiver. I can't find one yeah. in this group. I guess it's Mike Kosecki, I mean, isn't it? You're gonna well, I mean, I, I think you're gonna play it. There'll be an awful lot of four receiver sets anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you'll have Parker and Williams on the outside, and then you'll have Gasicki, and then a mix of Grant, Ford. You know, they they can both play the slot. I, I think Isaiah Ford. I mean, I think in the four receiver sets to start the season, it wouldn't surprise me if it was Parker, Gasicki, Williams, uh, and, and Ford. I mean, Ford showed. Excellent hands, the ability to get open, and reliability in important moments down the stretch. You know, you go back to that game against the Jets in the Meadowlands. You know, he showed up big towards the end of the season. I think, um, I think Isaiah Ford has got a leg up on that on, on that spot. But look, that's not saying an awful lot. Um, you know, we liked him at Virginia Tech, but you know, he was a seventh round pick for a reason. So we shall see. All right, moving on to the offensive line. Uh, it got floated that Jesse Davis could play at center. Is that a thing? Is that possible? It doesn't say a lot for the signing of Ted Karras. <laughs> no, it does, does not. It? I, I mean, uh, and look, I think this is part of the reason why you're not necessarily going to see Tua starting the season because as much as they've fixed the offensive line, you know, in terms of, look, who they brought in, Hunt, Austin Jackson, uh, Solomon Kindley, Karras, Danell Stanley, you know, they've brought in five, six guys. Flowers. Are we, flowers. Are we any... Um, 
are we any the wiser about how, how how much better this unit, if at all, is going to be? You know, well, they, there they, are they sure, as hell, they sure as hell did not implement what my plan was. Remember, if you remember, my plan was buy one, trade for one, and draft one. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't do any of the trading. And as far as the signing, when I meant sign, I, I thought an Austin Peet. You know, I thought a, a a borderline Pro Bowl performer is what was needed on this line, namely on the left side. But they didn't do that either. They went out and they got Eric Flowers. I mean, you can go through the list of uh, of players. I've got the names in front of me, and you know, Shaq Calhoun. Yeah, you know, kind of back up, struggled to make the team. Julian Davenport. Nobody wants him starting at left tackle. No. Um, come opening day, Jesse Davis. You know, it comes to something when Jesse Davis might be the most reliable player that there is on the roster in terms of like, offensive linemen. Um, Michael Dieter, you know, he's got a huge amount to prove, um, you know, and if he doesn't show it, you know, he might not even make the team. Jonathan Hubbard, nobody really knows. Robert Hunt, you know, upside is huge. but yes. it's a big and he does up. look the part. He looks great. Yeah, Physically. But, but, you know, where's he going to play? We don't even know if he's going to play right tackle or right guard yet. So, you know, it's that, that's up in the air. Isadora, kind of just a guy. Austin Jackson, 21 today, happy birthday. But, you know, huge question marks to expect him to come in and play from play at um, uh, uh, left tackle from uh, opening week and protect whoever it is that's, that's playing at quarterback. Huge question marks. Colt Meyer, meh, you know, Kindley, you know, is Solly going to play and uh, and start from week one at left tackle? And if he does, that means he's beat at left guard. And if he does, that means he's beating out Eric Flowers. And what does that tell you? You know, can can Kindley kick across to right guard? Well, potentially, but then you know, are you really going to start Kindley and Robert Hunt on the right side? I, I don't know. You know, Karras, part of the reason the Patriots' offense stuttered so badly last year was because he couldn't get out in the screen game. Danielle Stanley, we kind of like Adam Pankey, meh. Keith Keaton Sutherland, meh. you know, Flowers. Who knows? You know, yeah, um, and Austin Jackson is a developmental marks. guy, really hugely developmental guy. Yeah, on that Bills on that Bills podcast I was on yesterday after they had a little fun at our expense with Chan Gailey, they did say something that was really interesting. They said that Chan Gailey, that nobody's better than Chan Gailey at hiding bad offensive linemen. Is that why he's here? Could that be why he's here? I mean, there's got to be a reason why he's here. I'm not sure anybody knows it, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. maybe, you know. <laughs> Can you imagine Chan sure. Gailey listening to this podcast? I'm not even sure Chan knows why he's here, frankly. I mean, that press conference he gave the other week, it was just like, oh, what? I'm the Dolphins. Are, who? When? Wow. You know, yeah. So yeah, when they called him coach, think, he said, coach of what? Yeah. I mean, look, there is an awful lot of question marks about the, I mean, frankly, there's an awful lot of question marks about, about the rest of the team. And as much as the improvements that we've made, you know, are there 10 guys on this team you could hang your hat on? Realistically, mm. I mean, if we're going to hang out hat on ten guys, Tua obviously, although obviously he hasn't proved anything. Breeder, you know, good player. Howard, good player. Parker, two, the two wide receivers. Well, I mean, well, Preston Williams, Williams his, upside, hang... his upside is yeah, but I okay. To, I'm talking about guys that you can say week one. You know, yeah, are going Parker. to be guys. Yeah, Parker. Yeah, Parker. I, I would rely on Parker as much as I've made fun of Parker over the years. Whenever he plays, he actually plays well. Like his numbers bear that out. His issue has always been availability. I mean, re- look, realistically, you can't even say let's rely on Tua. Actually, I mean, so guys that you could hang your hat on week one in terms of guys that we know can get the job done: Breeder, Howard, uh, Parker, Gasicki's getting there. So that's four offensive mm. line. I mean. I mean Jesse Davis maybe, but God Almighty, that's you know. Yeah, it's not. We're hanging, it's, our, we're hanging our hat on that guy. Yeah. You know, the defensive line, Godshaw. I mean, is there anybody else you'd hang your hat on? Lawson uh, maybe. Godshaw's a consistent performer. Uh, Ogba coming off the corner, he's he's noticeable. But he's he's a guy not you healthy down on though. To get to never been healthy. Never been healthy. Baker. But when he is Baker. healthy, he gets to the quarterback. Yeah, Baker, you can hang your hat on. McMillan, I think you can hang your hat on. Van and Van Noy, you know, Van Noy's played in Super Bowls, so. And then, the, you know, Jones. The two corners, the two corners and Eric well, Rowe. Eric Rose has enough, uh, he has enough experience and good tape from last year that you could say, okay, like that guy's not going to embarrass you. 
back then. Can you hang your hat on Xavier Howard realistically? No, well, he has to. He has to be healthy. Like he, he gets yeah. off. He gets off the injured list, and then he goes on the COVID list. <laughs> like this guy's so finding so ways saying, to not get onto the field now. So yeah. we're saying there's eight, nine guys that you could absolutely hang your hat on, and yes. there's, a, there's a group of guys that you know with upside to uh, obviously Preston, obviously, you know Hunt, obviously Jackson, obviously, you know. And Zach Sealer makes me scratch my head. Like this is a guy that you know maybe we found something there. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean, look. This is a kid from Ferris State. He was a 238th overall pick who, you know, are we hanging our hat on a guy with 12 total tackles and one sack? <laughs> yeah, that's that's asking a bit much, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think the team has made significant strides. I think there's an awful lot of dross that's still on the roster, you know, and I, I think uh, uh, as well as we played to get five wins last year, I would be surprised if we are that much further along on the win column. There's just too many question marks. Too many question marks, mm-hmm. you know? I, I just think, you know, they need help in other areas. I don't, you know, and look, for better or worse, they've hung their hat on Jackson and 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 Hunt. Mm-hmm. You've got to say that they're going to get, those boys are going to be given the chance. You know, left tackle and, uh, and and right tackle. You know, I know because having spoken to somebody at the Dolphins, he's going to be given every chance to win the right tackle job. So there's your tackles. Are we set on the interior positions? <sighs> Who can say? And after a free agency and a draft where we had so much capital, to still be in a position to say we know nothing about the offensive line is a scary no. thing. Yes, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. And uh, one thing you can say, and I've, I've tried to dig deep on this, and, you know, it's, it's hard not to be optimistic because of all the, you know, all the new players that they've added and, of course, the quarterback. You know, you know that, that lends for optimism by itself. Yeah. But I keep looking at that offensive line, and I'm like, okay, what are they going to be good at? And the only thing that I can figure out is that if they do run as many lead isos as Chang Gailey likes to run, that entails a lot of double teams. <laughs> They got a couple of road graders in Flowers and in Kinley that should be good at that. So I guess I'm they'll be worried. good running in between the tackles. Maybe. You've got to play to the strengths. Got to play to the strengths. It's the uh, only expect, strength, really. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. Somebody's got – somebody apart from Parker and Williams has got to emerge at receiver. One of those two backs has really got to step up. You've got to have a career season from Kosicki, and that line has got to gel pretty quickly. For mm-hmm. this team to to be competitive, so what are your expectations for Jackson and Hunt this season? What do you expect them? Like, let's say week seventeen. Let's say they're healthy. Think, healthy, of course. What do you expect? I think, I think that Hunt will have had his struggles um, to handle speed um, and may even be a guard. But I think people will look at him and say, you know what? There's there's a lot to work with here. I think people will be the jury will be significantly out on Austin Jackson. Um, but he's a baby. He's 21 years old. And that's, you know, I, he wasn't drafted for 2021 or 2020. He was. He does win the, by the way, we, we've already seen them moving around out there. Of course, it's not in pads, but he does win the best body Olympics. I can tell you yeah. that. And, you know, turn on the film. He moves really, really well, but he, you know, there are too many times on tape that he gets beaten and that won't have been beaten out of him yet he has got to work incredibly hard to become a, a, a you know a franchise left tackle and then at some point you have to say was getting rid of Laramie Tunsil worth it mm-hmm. you know yeah, yeah. was getting although, rid of Fitzpatrick worth it although you gotta say man, you, know, you gotta say guess. all of that capital all that capital that they got back you know they had no way of knowing at the time that Tua Tungvalu was just gonna drop right to you at number five you know what yeah, I mean? but all that capital is only good if you use it wisely, and yeah. the jury's out as to whether or not they've used it wisely. Yeah, uh, it could have been. It, it, uh, the way I prefer to look at it is that all that capital was an insurance policy to go get to a tongue of ILO. You just got lucky, but now you got to make that capital count. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. you know. Now moving 100%. on to the final position, that's the quarterbacks, and yeah, it's what everybody's been waiting for. Something interesting that Brian Flores also said. He kind of broke some news. He says that that a lot of NFL teams are exploring to do it only in season, by the way, but a quarterback quarantine, can that work? I mean, I think it's going to have to, you know, it's the most important position on the, on the team. Um, 
you know, and look, let, we're, we're talking about three pretty professional guys, you know, and especially with Fitz as the as the leader of that party, you know, two are following him around like a little puppy. Josh, obviously, you know, hugely impressive in the off season in terms of the work that he did, the throwing that he did with receivers, the organisation skills that he showed. You know, I, I don't, I don't think it's an look, lads. It's five months of your life to go and live in a hotel. I mean, look, it's it's difficult when you've got families, you've got kids, you've got, you know, you've got wives, those sorts of things. Yeah, it's difficult, but it's five months of your life and you're being paid a significant amount of cash. To yeah, do and it. they're not going to so, put you up in a, in a holiday inn, you know what I mean? And no, yeah, exactly. You're not, saying that, you're not saying that Howard Johnson's or a red roof, you know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're going to get you a house with a pool and a grill and yeah, a chef to deliver swanky. your food, you know. It's yeah. going to be pretty squ- swanky conditions. Now... Yeah. It gets right to the point. What are your expectations for his rookie year? Over, under on games. I'm going to put it at eight. Over or uh, under eight games started for Tua Tonga Bailoa this year? He'll play. He'll start less than eight games. Okay. Unless there's an injury. Uh, look, I wouldn't rule Josh Rosen out from, from playing a game. You know, who's – are we realistically thinking that, that Tua is immediately going to jump Josh Rosen? In, in the pile, given that Josh has had the time within the organization that Tua hasn't had, Josh isn't coming off the injury, all those other things. You know, I'm not necessarily sold that there's this immediate rush to get him playing if he's not 100% ready and if that offensive line. Look, the history is littered with quarterbacks who have been thrown into the fire too early, mainly because they got crushed by offense, the offensive line, not mm-hmm. being good enough. David Carr, you know, that there are reams of them doesn't help my argument that i can only think of david carr but there are lots of quarterbacks <laughs> who've been thrown into the fire behind bad offensive lines and have never been the same again people you know, could make an want... argument that ryan Tannehill, his career was stunted at first by starting yeah. and taking the many as many hits as he took here to start his career in miami so you know and again i'm not trying to be, be a fun guy. sponge I, I i love the kid i think he's you know he's incredible people who've listened to this podcast know how i feel about him but I just, they've got to think that it's absolutely right. He's got to be 100% right. He's, you know, it's an awful lot to ask for two weeks to be ready to play in the NFL, you know, especially behind a piecemeal offensive line with receivers going down and running backs who are completely new to the team, to the area, to the system, those sorts of things. You know, that that's a hell of an ask for, it's a hell of an ask for anybody, frankly. You know, it's a big ask for Tom Brady to go out and, you know, to go out and learn a new system. You know, look, Bruce Arians' system is downfield throwing. You know, that's not Tom Brady's strength. So what's going to happen with Godwin and Mike Evans and Gronkowski and all these running backs they've now got and, uh, you know, OJ Howard and those sorts of things. How is that? It's not going to be easy for a guy that's won six Super Bowls. It, it isn't. It's not just turning up. And there's a reason why, you know, he's been working out in parks every single day since, since he signed with the Buccaneers. Mm-hmm. You know, that's... That's a given. You know, Tua hasn't had that luxury, and he's also not 42 years old. He's not had the benefit of, of doing what Brady has done. Um, I just think we need to keep it in perspective. I think if there's an injury, it wouldn't surprise me, certainly early in the season, if, uh, if Josh Rosen got the nod. There, there's no need to, to pile pressure onto the kid. None whatsoever. And actually, you know, if it ended up that he had the same rookie uh, season as... Patrick Mahomes did, uh, where he comes in, he plays, you know, mops up a couple of times and then starts the final two games of the season if the, you know, if the Dolphins are out of playoff contention. I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. Mm-hmm. I, I don't. I, I just don't see the point in him going out, getting absolutely battered behind a terrible offensive line with receivers who can struggle to get open, a running game that might not get going because the offensive line's bad and he's just taking a pounding and we go three and 30. I just don't see the point. I mean, yeah. what, what what possible benefit is that for that? I don't see there's any apart from gaining a bit of experience. But experience of what? Experience to get the shit kicked out of you. I mean, you know, if he comes in, the Dolphins are four and twelve, or you know, four and eleven back into the season. He comes in, yeah, you know, he starts a game, he plays pretty well. The offensive line have had time to gel. Then you know who knows, and then that sets you up for 2022, 2021, because you've also then got two picks in the first round, two picks in the second round. You go and get yourself a Creed Humphrey and a Jalen Waddle, uh, you know, and a Pat Frymuth, and a, you know, mm-hmm. and boom, away you go. Um, 
I, I just don't necessarily see the need to. No, Dolphins aren't winning the Super Bowl this year, guys. I, I'm sorry to break that to you. Mm. Um, yeah, no. So the, I just the high end. See the the high end expectations are since there's an extra playoff team is to contend for that last spot, at least make it to the last month of the season. Yeah, contending for that yeah. last spot. So, you know, you want to improve on five wins, of course. Yeah, you know, of course. You know, course, and if you could get to eight and eight, if you could get to eight and eight, you know, and you could do, if you could get to eight and eight with Tua getting you to eight and eight, it's a great help for twenty twenty one. Of course, of course. Look, he could come in and do exactly what I've said. He, you know, he he can't do, or not that he can't do, because again, I think he's incredible. I really, really do. But I just think we just need to slightly pump the brakes on everything that he's been through. What else is around him at this point? You know, he's not stepping into the. He's not stepping into the Saints' offense. He's not stepping into the Bucks' offense. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not stepping into to, to some of these offenses around the league. He's stepping into a pretty poor offense with a myriad of questions at every position. You know, even you know, look, we've said Mike Gesicki is a guy that we can hang out on. I mean, let's be realistic. He has been yeah. underwhelming, and uh, you know, only uh, only picked up the back end of last year, the second half of last season. Yeah, could point to the fact that Gesicki. Okay, looks like we've got a player here. But we're hanging our hat on a guy who's, you know, who's had eight or nine decent games. Yeah, you know, let's um, let's just be realistic about. The and to be fair, what he, what Mike Gesicki was doing was winning a lot of fifty-fifty balls and getting open yeah. fan coverage. Okay. Yeah, but he, you know, so I am absolutely. There weren't, they, of, these weren't teams that were focusing on Mike Gesicki. No, That'll come if he keeps doing this. I'm absolutely of the opinion that Tua will win at least one and probably more Super Bowls as quarterback in the Miami Dolphins. Absolutely convinced of that. But it won't be yet. And let's not ruin him before he can get to that point behind, okay. playing behind a, a piecemeal line. Yeah. All right. Uh, to close up here, uh, I watched you, – you said you don't get it in the U.K. yet. But it was interesting because um, – Training camp starts on Monday, and I will or will not be there. I'm still waiting on word from the Miami Dolphins. Remember, it's a different year this year. Okay, obviously, I would have to test there on site to be to cover the team, as I have every single off season for you for you our listeners. So I haven't they haven't gotten back to me yet. But on that show, Hard Knocks, it was kind of interesting what they were showing what how they were going to do training camp and. They're starting with installations, okay? And I like your opinion on this, and we could close on this. They're starting with insta- installations, so it's mostly classroom work and walkthroughs, and they're going to close camp with the physicality. Usually it's the other way around. I would say that hurts rookies especially, right? Mm. Yeah, but, absolutely. But uh, I don't know. I, I think uh, I'd, I'd hate to be, you know, doomsayer, but I think that's going to make for some bad football to start the season. Oh, unquestionably. And I said that, you know, this is the, you know, I think you're going to be looking, teams are going to be looking at guys who are cross trained across a number of positions, perhaps more so than, you know, than relying on rookies that they would ordinarily. You know, is there a guy on the team that can perform three or four roles for you? two or three roles, ha, 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 you know, guys that can play special teams and can contribute on offense slash defense are going to be huge this year, more so than, than, than anywhere else, because I just think rookies are behind the eight ball. The flip side to that is that they have had an awful lot of time, more than they ever would before. But these guys are, uh, are incredible athletes. So the installs that they've done through Zoom classes and look, being locked up in hotel rooms and uh, yeah, Peter King's column this week, he talked to John Reed, the fourth round pick of the of the Texans, cornerback from Penn State. You know, it, he was like, as soon as we get back from the facility, five o'clock, five thirty, they cook up their own meals. They they give them meals to take them home. They they heat them up in the microwave they have or the the oven they have in their hotel rooms. And Reed's like, you know, I'm diving into books for four hours until I turn the light out. That wouldn't necessarily be what would happen in a normal training camp. You, you know, you might go out and play bowls, you know, temping bowling. You might go out and, I don't know, to the track or, or whatever. But you, you're not always got your nose in the book. But he's said, you know, for, since they've been drafted, that's all they've had. That's all they've been able to do is install work. Mm-hmm. So to that end, mentally, you might see rookies more switched. It'll be the physical reps that they're lacking. And, and I think that's why... You know, I think it's putting into practice on those installs that they've, you know, that they've had throughout the spring and early summer, putting them into practice now around everybody else. And then let's see where you are physically. I, you know, I, I understand the process. You know, it, it's weird. This is a weird year, but I do understand the process. 
Yeah. Uh, well, it's, uh, I really do recommend it because it was, it was eye opening, especially all the COVID protocols that the NFL is installing. Uh, these guys, you know, these guys can't go very far without being tested and then retested and then being followed there. Uh, some of them are actually wearing monitors and if they get mm. too close to people, they beep. Mm. <laughs> so it's kind of, it, it's odd, but you know, it's an odd year. You want to get a, a football season in all, all these measures matter, you, you know, hundred percent. So yeah, I do. I really do recommend it. Uh, I don't know when you can get it at the UK. I'm gonna try to get you a copy. I have my ways. I'm just having, okay. just having a look. Oh, it, it does come. It, it will be here. Um, it's not up tonight, but maybe it'll be available tomorrow. So, but it was interesting. All good. It was a, it was yeah, really really interesting first episode. All right, guys, you can't complain. After months and months of us talking a bunch of bullshit on this on this show, we gave you a beefy training camp preview. It's because Corfin wasn't here. Yeah, yeah. so it was his fault, wasn't it? (laughs) Okay, so you can't complain. We gave you a really beefy training camp preview. Get you ready for Monday. Of course, I will be there or not. I will let you know. I'll let you know on the Three Yards Per Carry Twitter account. But that's it. There is no more. We will talk to you guys next week. Thanks for listening to Three Yards Per Carry. You can subscribe via iTunes on Podbean or your usual podcast provider.